Hello and welcome to Psycho Killer, the true crime podcast about Britain's worst criminals. I'm Simon Ford, a writer and journalist. I'm Jack Morell, a former major crime detective. My job may have been to investigate crimes and put criminals away, but I've always tried to understand what makes them tick. And a very warm welcome to Pitt Watts, who's helped us with this investigation. Thanks, Simon. In this episode, we're on the trail of a child killer. According to one senior police officer, this monster is the reason British kids don't play outside on their own anymore. He single-handedly destroyed an age of innocence. His name was Robert Black. Children are the hands by which we take hold of heaven. So said the American social reformer Henry Ward Beecher. The children who fell into Robert Black's clutches were dragged to hell. I'd be uh, driving along and see a young girl. I'd go out and talk to her and try to persuade her to get into the van and uh, take her somewhere quiet. When he was a kid, his nickname was Smelly Bobby Tulip, an angry loner obsessed with little girls. He started out weird and morphed into Britain's most feared predatory paedophile. Black, from Grangemouth in Scotland, was convicted of the kidnap, rape, sexual assault and murder of four girls, but is suspected of more. Pip has been researching his childhood and adolescence. Robert Black was put up for adoption within weeks of his birth on the 21st of April 1947, the illegitimate son of Jesse Hunter Black and an unknown father. The baby wasn't adopted and at the age of six months was fostered by a couple called Tulip from Kinloch Leven in the Highlands of Scotland. Robert was an antisocial child. He had few friends and was bullied. He bullied younger children and vandalised school property. At an early age, he developed a deep interest in female genitalia and bodily orifices. By all accounts, his foster parents insisted on cleanliness, but Robert didn't care, which is how he got the nickname Smelly Bobby. The Tulips died by the time he was 11 and Robert was placed with a new foster family in Kinloch Leven. They kicked him out after he committed his first sex crime, dragging a little girl into a public lavatory and assaulting her. Black reverted to his mother's name. He spent his teens in residential homes in Falkirk and Edinburgh, where he regularly exposed himself to girls. After tearing off a girl's knickers, he was sent to Red House, an all-male approved school in Musselburgh. Here, Black was abused for three years, being forced to perform oral sex on a male member of staff. He left Red House in 1963. He moved to Greenock and got his first job as a delivery boy. Out on his bike with a basket of chops and sausages, Bobby Black had one thing on his mind. Little girls. If he found one home alone, he'd assault her. He later admitted to 30 or 40 such offences. In truth, he'd lost count. He wasn't reported, and so he just carried on. Jack, you've worked on child protection cases. What does Robert Black's start in life tell us about his pattern of offending? It tells me that we've come a long way, Simon. His behaviour needed to be acknowledged, understood and managed under what we now call multi-agency approach. I worked on historic abuse cases and got to understand how these residential homes worked. Children were sent to them for a variety of reasons. Children who needed individual support packages, but who were all thrown into homes and treated the same and treated as an inconvenience by those institutions, which were, quite frankly, a melting pot of abusers and denial. 
To start with, child protection and social services in the 1950s were very different from what they are today. That approved school system was a hangover from before the war. There wasn't the oversight of institutions, many of which were run like boot camps and managed by men born of Great War parents and who'd served in the Second World War. Yes, we know that discipline and a routine is good for children's development, but these managers, often ex-military, didn't have the skills to help those messed up kids. Who knows how much harm was caused to generations of vulnerable children and young adults in institutions like Red House Care Home. Plenty of kids have a rough start in life. Yes, the child was abandoned by his mother, but he had foster parents to care for him. How suitable were they? Did they beat him? It's possible. He never knew his dad, who probably didn't know Robert even existed. Young Robert had a raw deal, but not every orphan turns into a predatory paedophile. We'll never know whether his upbringing was to blame for his intense fascination with girls' genitals. It's natural for some kids to be curious, I suppose, but this kid was off the scale. He later told police it started when he was five. He compared his genitals with a girl in his class, as kids do. This experience, Black said, convinced him he should have been born female. In the 50s and 60s, children's sexuality would not have been acknowledged. Kids who were different weren't listened to, just punished. Remember, even state schools were run on a Christian basis, Adam and Eve, Sodom and Gomorrah. Scotland has an independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. Certainly the one in England has recently acknowledged that there was abuse in our major religions and that child protection was not a priority. Nowadays, we understand more about gender identity. Most people identify strongly with the gender they're expected to grow up as, but it's not uncommon for a person to identify strongly with the other gender. Sometimes the desire lasts only a brief time, and sometimes it lasts a lifetime. Some transgender people choose to live the role of the gender they identify with, and some don't. Some transgender people choose to become transsexual by having their gender reassigned through hormone treatments and or surgery. Was Robert Black transgender? We're into the realm of what-ifs here, but suppose he was. Did he have someone to trust, someone who understood gender identity issues? No, absolutely not. This was Britain in the 1950s. It was illegal to be homosexual. To be queer or questioning was the ultimate taboo. So Black was an outcast, vulnerable, abused, and misunderstood. This does not, of course, explain his predatory instincts. What happened during his time at Red House? He was systematically raped and brutalized, forced to perform sex acts by an authority figure. To my mind, this is where the boundaries between sex and violence become blurred. This is where kids become even more confused. He's told that his behavior was wrong, only to be sexually abused by his carer. Understandably, young Robert Black withdrew into his private fantasy world, a world filled with little girls, willing, compliant little girls who would bend to his will. Little girls who'd do whatever he wanted, whatever he told them to do. Of course, children aren't like that, which is why Black had to take what he wanted and remove all traces afterwards. In short, for him to act out his fantasies and stay a free man, the victims had to die. It was inevitable. Black's offending escalated. One evening in 1963, he saw a seven-year-old girl playing alone in a park. He lured her to a deserted building. Then he throttled her until she was unconscious and masturbated over her body. Black was arrested and charged, but after a psychiatric examination, they let him off with a warning. Black moved back to Grangemouth. The big industry was petrochemicals. At the time, there was an oil refinery there. The chimneys, the smoke and the smell dominated the place. He got a job and found lodgings with an elderly couple. He began dating a local lass and asked her to marry him, but she turned him down. She was his only girlfriend. 
In 1966, Black's landlords discovered he'd been assaulting their nine-year-old granddaughter and kicked him out. But they didn't involve the police. They thought the little girl had been through enough. And so it went on. Black lost his job. He moved back to Kinloch Leven. He took up lodgings with a couple. They had a six-year-old daughter. Within a year, he was charged with three counts of indecent assault against her and was sentenced to a year in a Borstal detention centre for young offenders. Black refused to discuss his experience there, but he vowed never to go back to prison, or should I say, never to get caught again. Black moved to London, where he got a job as a lifeguard at a swimming pool. He soon got the sack. No prizes for guessing why. He took up photography and started collecting child porn. His only other interest was darts, which he played at his local, the Three Crowns in Stamford Hill. That's where he met Edward and Cathy Rayson, who let him their attic room. Black stayed there from 1972 until his arrest in 1990. So, what was Black doing beyond collecting indecent images of children? Black bought a van and set himself up as a delivery driver. In 1976, he got his first proper job with Poster Dispatch and Storage Limited, a firm that supplied posters for advertising hoardings all over the UK. He crisscrossed the country, Ireland and continental Europe. Black came to know the UK road network like the back of his hand. It was this that allowed him to snatch children and dump their bodies hundreds of miles away. He disguised himself with different glasses, grew a beard and shaved it off, grew his hair, then cut it short. He put curtains in the back of his van from where he'd photograph children at play. Like a wolf, he stalked his prey and then he struck. We'll never know the full extent of Black's offending. He was proven to have committed four murders. In prison, Black was asked about a number of unsolved disappearances of young girls in the UK and Europe. He refused to cooperate with the authorities and denied the families of those missing children closure, taking what he knew to the grave. This was pure form psychopathic behaviour. By the age of 34, Robert Black was a fully-fledged psycho, and his reign of terror was just beginning. On the 12th of August 1981, Black abducted, sexually assaulted and murdered nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi as she cycled to a friend's house in Ballinderry, County Antrim. They found her bike less than a mile from home. Six days later, anglers discovered her body in a reservoir. Her mum said she'd last seen Jenny at 20 past one on the afternoon of the 12th. The little girl's wristwatch had stopped at 20 to six. The terror she'd endured in those four hours is unimaginable. Little Jenny had been sexually abused, strangled and drowned. Not quite a year later, 11-year-old Susan Maxwell was walking home from playing tennis in Coldstream on the English side of the Anglo-Scottish border. She was last seen alive at 4.30pm on the 30th of July 1982, crossing the bridge over the River Tweed. The BBC's Crime Watch programme reconstructed the events of that afternoon. The afternoon of Friday the 30th of July was warm and sunny, and Susan had arranged to play tennis with a friend in Coldstream. They finished their game at about four o'clock and Susan had two and a half miles to walk home to Cornhill. Her route took her down the main road, the A697, and then right across the bridge over the River Tweed, which forms the border between Scotland and England. Susan was last seen on this stretch of road, just beyond the bridge. She was wearing bright yellow shorts and shirt and carrying a tennis racket. Black abducted Susan Maxwell soon after that last sighting. Witnesses reported seeing a white van parked nearby. 300 police officers searched 80 square miles. They checked every house and outbuildings in Coldstream and Cornhill, where Susan lived. But there was no trace. 
Then, on the 12th of August, a year to the day after Jennifer Cardi's abduction, a lorry driver found Susan's remains in a lay-by. She'd been gagged with surgical tape, and her knickers had been removed and placed under her head. It later transpired that Susan had been in the back of Black's van, dead or alive, for more than 24 hours. Another year, another summer. Caroline Hogg, a fair-haired five-year-old, was playing in the street outside her Edinburgh home. It was a mellow July evening at the end of a hot, dusty Friday. Caroline went out just after seven wearing a pretty lilac party dress and pink sneakers. The coastal suburb of Portobello was a safe neighbourhood. Kids always played out, and on a Friday night there were plenty of adults around to keep an eye on them. When Caroline failed to come home by half past seven, her family went out looking for her. A boy said he'd seen her with a man heading towards the promenade and the fun fair by the beach. The search for Caroline was the largest in Scottish history at the time. The police and 2,000 volunteers, backed by local troops, went from house to house through the whole of Edinburgh. Caroline's disappearance was headline news. Nine known paedophiles were traced and eliminated. Piece by piece, the nightmare unfolded. Eyewitnesses reported seeing a furtive-looking man hanging around. He was wearing horn-rimmed spectacles. He'd followed Caroline to a playground. A local teen said the man spoke to the little girl before they walked hand-in-hand to the fairground. The man in horn-rimmed glasses paid for Caroline to ride on a carousel while he watched. They then left. A witness told police the little girl seemed frightened. That was on the 8th of July. Ten days later, Caroline's naked body was found in a ditch close to the M1 motorway in Leicestershire, more than 300 miles from Edinburgh. The lack of clothing suggested a sexual motive, but Caroline's remains were too badly decomposed to know for sure. Her dress and shoes were never found. Jack. Bearing in mind that Jennifer Cardi's murder wasn't linked to Black until much later, the police were dealing with two child sex murders. Tell us about the investigation. There were striking similarities between the murders of Susan Maxwell and Caroline Hogg. Detectives agreed that they were looking for one killer, probably a van driver, a lorry driver or a travelling salesman. They decided to set up a coordinated task force to catch this man under the command of Hector Clark, the Assistant Chief Constable of Northumbria Police. Psychiatrists suggested the killer was a sociopath or psychopath. He was probably an opportunist who was ready to strike at a moment's notice. Both Susan and Caroline had been wearing white ankle socks. This might have been a psychological trigger. While the psychiatrists continued their analysis, the hard slog got underway. It's this unglamorous but meticulous investigating, the backbone of all successful investigations. Interviewing, recording, checking, cross-referencing. They started out using a card filing system, but soon there were half a million cards relating to Susan Maxwell alone. The investigation was in danger of being overwhelmed by the sheer amount of data, something which had blighted the hunt for the Yorkshire Ripper which we covered in an earlier episode. The police were determined not to repeat that fiasco, so they put their faith in technology, in the form of the UK's first computerised database, Homes. Homes stood for Home Office Large Major Inquiry System. When I joined the police, it was still relatively new and expensive, but it could collate all the information linked to the inquiry. Hector Clark convinced the Home Secretary, William Whitelaw, to sign the £250,000 cheque and oversaw Home's installation at the Child Murder Bureau in Bradford. The database held details of 189,000 people and 220,000 vehicles, plus interviews with more than 60,000 potential witnesses. With four police forces, two incident rooms, and three confidential hotlines, Holmes became the nerve centre of the investigation. Police netted a number of child sex offenders, but their main target, 
the killer of Susan and Caroline evaded the dragnet. After two years of data collection and analysis, not to mention police overtime, the government started asking questions. Specifically, a new Home Secretary, Douglas Hurd, wanted to see some return on the investment. Then, in March 1986, everything changed. It was just before eight o'clock on a rainy spring evening. Ten-year-old Sarah Harper went to buy a loaf of bread at the corner shop, a hundred yards from her home in the Leeds suburb of Morley. The shopkeeper sold Sarah the bread and two packets of crisps. They noticed a balding man who briefly entered the shop. He didn't buy anything and left while Sarah was paying. Two local girls saw Sarah hurrying into an alley heading to her home on Brunswick Place. It was the last time she was seen alive. Again, thousands of properties were searched. Divers trawled a nearby reservoir, but Sarah had vanished without trace. Mike Smart reported on the search operation for BBC Look North. The search is being coordinated from this mobile control room near Sarah's home. Morley Town Centre has been split into a grid pattern, and it's here that officers with local knowledge brief the search teams. Among them, the man who first heard of her disappearance. PC Stuart Pearson is community officer for this area, and he's frequently warned of the dangers to children left on their own. For him, like so many of his colleagues, this is no ordinary inquiry. I think every community policeman would agree that, uh, in a sense, you feel that any incident that happens on your beat is your responsibility. Um, but then, um, the local schools have been spoken to on the dangers of speaking with strangers. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, it, uh, it has uh, upset me personally to some, to some extent, yes. As the uncertainty remains, Sarah's distraught family can only wait for news. Her 26-year-old mother, who's expecting another child, has been under sedation since last week. Meanwhile, other families in the area now share the fear in this close-knit community. At a press conference on the 3rd of April, Sarah's mother, Jackie, told journalists she feared her daughter was dead. The worst torment was not knowing. She made a direct appeal to her daughter's abductor to reveal the whereabouts of her daughter's body, saying, I just want her back, even if she's dead. If someone would just pick up the phone and tell us where the body is. A fortnight later, a man found Sarah's partially dressed, gagged and bound body floating in the River Trent at Wilford in Nottingham. A post-mortem examination revealed she died between five and eight hours after she was last seen alive. The cause of death was drowning. She was probably unconscious before being thrown into the water. Before she died, Sarah had been subjected to a violent assault causing injuries pathologist Professor Stephen Jones described on the 1995 ITV Night Stalker programme. She had rather minor bruises to her head. She had some gripping injuries to her arm. She had very, very severe and awful sexual injuries, the worst I have ever seen. And these had been inflicted during life. We subsequently established by scientific means that she, the actual cause of her death was drowning. In other words, she was still alive before she was put into the water. Was this crime linked to the murders of Susan Maxwell and Caroline Hogg? A witness reported a white van parked near a tributary of the River Trent and a man acting suspiciously. The dates tallied. Detectives concluded the killer had driven down the M1 motorway from Leeds dumped Sarah's body and probably refuelled nearby. Jack, what convinced the police Sarah Harper's murder was part of a series? There were several similarities. All three victims were prepubescent white females. The killer made little or no attempt to hide the bodies. They were all discovered within 26 miles of the Leicestershire town of Ashby de la Zouche. However, there was still the possibility these were coincidences, or that it was the work of a copycat. Nevertheless, in November 1986, Sarah Harper's murder was formally linked to the series, 
and the investigation moved up a gear. Six police forces were now involved in the hunt for the child killer. The headquarters moved to Wakefield with Hector Clark at the helm. The way he ran the investigation impressed a young local detective. Bob Taylor went on to be Detective Chief Superintendent of West Yorkshire Police. That is the senior investigator's job, is managing the information to ensure that the lines of inquiry are viable and achievable and not just, you know, going off um, on, a, on a limb uh, or a whim. On the 21st of April 1986, the head of Scotland Yard's Criminal Intelligence Branch, Philip Corbett, held a summit meeting at Scotland Yard to discuss how best to share information between the forces involved in the manhunt and to investigate potential links with 19 other unsolved child murders. Senior officers attended from 16 UK police forces. By now, the inquiry had cost more than a million pounds. Pip's been looking at probably the most significant outcome of that summit meeting. Investigators contacted the FBI to request a psychological profile of the child killer. It took nearly two years to complete. This profile described the killer as a white male aged between 30 and 40, likely closer to 40, who was a classic loner. This offender would be unkempt in appearance and had received less than 12 years of formal education. He probably lived alone in rented accommodation in a lower middle-class neighbourhood. The killings were sexually motivated, the profile continued, and the offender was probably fixated on child pornography. He kept souvenirs from his victims. It was chilling reading, and as things turned out, uncannily accurate. In April 1988... While the British police were digesting the FBI's offender profile, Robert Black made his first mistake. He tried to snatch Theresa Thornhill, a slightly built 15-year-old, off the street in Nottingham. Theresa told ITV Central News about her ordeal. I was walking up the street and this blue van parked on the opposite side of the road and this bloke got out. He went to, went to open his bonnet and he shouts, Oi! You know, looking around, ignoring. Why can you fix vans? Took no notice. And then next minute, big guy come along, got me from the side with my arms pinned to my side, and got his hand over my mouth and my nose, which I couldn't hardly breathe, ready for passing out. And um, I was trying to fight for my life. And eventually, my arms got freed because I bit his forearm, <clears throat> and then. I grabbed hold of his testicles and he said something like, you fucking bitch. And um, I was, he was trying to get me into the van and I was screaming for my mum, but I knew my mum couldn't hear me. Eventually Andrew heard me scream and he jumped over a fence nearby and um, he sort of like stopped at the corner of the street and he shouts, oh, you fat bastard, let her go. And the guy panics looks up the street, thinks, oh no, somebody's seen me, gets in his van, and uh, he drove off. The teens got a good look at the man and gave the police an excellent description. It would be more than two years before Black felt bold enough to attempt another abduction. And this time, it would be his undoing. If you believe in guardian angels, there was one walking the beat in the village of Stowe on the 14th of July 1990. Stowe is a close-knit community on the Scottish borders where everyone knows everyone else and their kids. David Herkus was mowing his front lawn when a Ford van pulled up across the road. The driver got out as David's neighbour's six-year-old daughter approached. In 1995, David Herkus told ITV's Night Stalker programme what he saw next. He walked round the van and opened the passenger door. 
the rest point, I was aware of a child walking towards the rear of the van. Next instance, the child's feet were beside his, then it disappeared. The driver was making a pushing motion to the passenger's floor area. I thought, oh, he's not putting a child on the floor. But the child never appeared in the seat or above the dash, so it had to be the case. The driver scrambled into the front seat and drove off. David Herkus noted the van's registration number and raised the alarm. The police were on the scene within minutes. Coincidentally, one of them happened to be the little girl's father. And then another astonishing stroke of fate. The van reappeared coming back through the village the way it had gone. That's him, that's the same van, shouted David Herkus. One officer jumped in front of the van to stop it. Others restrained the driver and another, the little girl's dad in fact, opened the back door and climbed in. Inside was a sleeping bag and inside the sleeping bag was the little girl. Her arms and legs were tightly bound. She was gagged with sticking plaster and a hood was tied over her head. Black had sexually assaulted her. With the professionalism typical of the British police, the arresting officers transported Black to Selkirk Police Station in one piece. On the way, he told officers, it was a rush of blood to the head. I've always liked little girls since I was a lad. I tied her up because I wanted to keep her until I dropped a parcel off. I was going to let her go. Black was charged with abduction and remanded in custody. Hector Clark was notified and travelled from Wakefield to interview the suspect. He left in no doubt that this was the man he'd been after since 1982. A search of Black's van found restraining devices including rope, sticking plaster and hoods, a Polaroid camera, numerous articles of girls' clothing, a mattress and a selection of sexual aids. Black claimed that on his long-distance deliveries, he would pull into a lay-by and dress in the children's clothing before masturbating. He couldn't explain the sex aids. In London, the Metropolitan Police swooped on Black's Stamford Hill lodgings, where they found a stash of graphic child pornography, including magazines and videos, some of which Black had brought back from his trips abroad. There were children's clothes and a newspaper detailing the attempted abduction of Teresa Thornhill in Nottingham. Jack, what's that moment like when you have a suspect in custody and then you find evidence linking them to a series of very serious crimes? Well, it's, it's easy to jump to an emotional conclusion, but at the end of the day, you know, our job is to provide the Crown Prosecution Service with sufficient evidence to bring the prosecution. So everything the Met found was evidence of something, but was it conclusive proof that Black had murdered those three girls? On its own, it wasn't. But the abduction in Stowe and the contents of Black's van and his remarks to the police, then the case was certainly building. They had a suspect and it was time to turn his life upside down to find out everything you can about Robert Black and set aside your feelings and go by the book. Once you've done your job, then you can relax. At the Edinburgh High Court on the 10th of August 1990, Black was tried for the abduction and sexual assault of the six-year-old girl from Stowe. He pleaded guilty to all the charges. The court heard his captive would have probably suffocated within 15 minutes if she'd not been rescued. Pip was Anything said by way of explanation or mitigation? Black's appointed defence lawyer, Herbert Kerrigan QC, and the Edinburgh Procurator Fiscal both ordered psychiatric evaluations of Black. These were carried out by prominent psychiatrists. Both reports were uncompromising regarding Black's deviancy and proclivities towards children. Kerrigan argued that the abduction had been unplanned. Black, he said, had intended to release the girl after assaulting her. 
He pointed out that Black freely admitted his paedophilic preferences and claimed to have successfully fought against the urge to abduct young girls prior to the Stowe incident. He also said that Black accepted that he was a danger to children and wished to undergo treatment. Lord Donald MacArthur Ross accepted the view that Black was and would remain an extreme danger to children and sentenced him to life imprisonment. With Black behind bars, Hector Clark's team interviewed their suspect again. Over six hours, Black opened up to two detectives, Andrew Watt and Roger Orr. He told them about his childhood sexual experiences, his attraction to little girls, and his penchant for wearing their clothes. He admitted assaulting more than 30 young girls between the 1960s and the 1980s, but he didn't want to talk about unsolved child murders and disappearances. Gradually, Watt and Orr increased the pressure, specifically in relation to the abduction of five-year-old Caroline Hogg. We have eyewitness accounts and service station receipts putting you in Portobello on the day of the abduction, they told him. They showed him photo-fit pictures that resembled him. Finally, they asked him to end the suffering of his victims' families and just confess. But Black clammed up. Jack, is there anything the police could have done to compel Robert Black to cooperate? No, there isn't. It was his legal right to refuse and he exercised it. Was there even something in his psyche that admitting to murder was a no-go area for him? Maybe it was something he'd learnt to shut out. Maybe it was his complete lack of empathy. In all my years of interviewing suspects, I've never worked out how or why some people explain how they committed the most awful violence. Not many do so, but when they do, it's often in a matter-of-fact way. So the police went back to doing what they do best, gathering and collating evidence for the CPS to present in court. It's worth mentioning for our American listeners here that in the UK, the accused is presumed to be innocent. The burden of proof lies with the state, that is, the Crown. To secure convictions, Hector Clark and the Crown prosecutors had to prove beyond reasonable doubt that Black had abducted and murdered Susan Maxwell, Caroline Hogg and Sarah Harper. They did that by meticulously mapping his expenses and travel records for the firm he worked for, Poster Dispatch and Storage Limited. Black always paid for fuel with a credit card and his employers kept excellent accounts. Plus, they had records of delivery runs going back for years. Detectives used these data points to put Black at or near the abduction and disposal sites of all three victims. Days before CCTV and GPS, it was as good as they were going to get. That was the bit of luck that all investigations need. Black had stayed with his employer for a long time, and for that matter, he'd stayed in the same rented room for years too. His life had well and truly been turned upside down. In 1992, a relieved Hector Clark was able to announce that criminal proceedings had been issued on the authority of the Crown Prosecution Service against Robert Black. Over the following two years, a series of pre-trial hearings set the stage for Black's eventual trial. The convicted child abductor was brought before Judge William McPherson at Moot Hall, Newcastle-upon-Tyne on the 13th of April 1994, where he pleaded not guilty to 10 charges of kidnap, murder, attempted kidnap and preventing the lawful burial of a body. For the Crown, John Milford QC contended that Black had kidnapped each victim for his own sexual gratification. He pointed out Black's extensive record of child sexual abuse and the paraphernalia discovered in his vehicle and at his London address. Milford closed his speech by stating that the petrol receipts and travel records would prove Black had been at all the abduction, attempted abduction and body recovery sites on the dates in question. Ronald Thwaites, defending, told the jury, 
No man can be expected to remember the ordinary daily routine of his life going back many years. He argued that the three murders were not part of a series and had not been committed by Black, and that the paraphernalia and pornography weren't proof his client had progressed from molester to murderer. Black, he said in his closing argument, was a self-confessed paedophile, but he was not a murderer. Where is the jury that will acquit a pervert of multiple murder, he asked. Before describing his client as someone against whom ample prejudice existed, but no hard evidence. On the 19th of May, the jury found Black guilty of three counts of kidnapping, three counts of murder, three counts of preventing the lawful burial of a body, and, in relation to Teresa Thornhill, one count of attempted abduction. He was sentenced to a term of life imprisonment for each of these counts, with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 35 years on each of the three murder charges. The sentences were to run concurrently. Passing sentence, Judge McPherson described Black as the perpetrator of offences which are unlikely ever to be forgotten and which represent a man at his most vile. Usually, that would be the end of it. Except in Robert Black's case, it wasn't. His trail of suffering was so extensive. In 2011, Black was tried and convicted of the 1981 abduction of Jennifer Cardy in Northern Ireland. Pip, how did the police service of Northern Ireland secure that conviction? Again, Black's petrol receipts, combined with his employer's diligent bookkeeping and some remarkable police work, were his undoing. Black was the only poster dispatch and storage driver willing to travel to Northern Ireland during the Troubles. The records showed that on the night of Jennifer's disappearance, Black had boarded an overnight ferry from Belfast to Liverpool before refuelling in Coventry the next day on his way back to London. The trial lasted six weeks. The jury deliberated for four hours and on the 27th of October, he was found guilty of abducting, sexually assaulting and murdering Jennifer Cardi. Her parents, Patricia and Andrew, had waited 30 years to see their daughter's killer brought to book. We have the relief of knowing that the perpetrator of this gruesome, horrible crime has been brought to justice. Robert Black stole the life of our daughter Jennifer, but Robert Black didn't steal the lives of me and my family. Black was given a further life sentence, the minimum term of which was later set at 25 years. Black was told he'd be at least 89 before he would be considered for release. In the end, he lasted only five more years in prison. Robert Black died of a heart attack on the 12th of January 2016, aged 68. After a short funeral in the prison chapel, which no family or friends attended, his body was cremated and his ashes thrown into the sea. The years of our life are three score and ten, or even by reason of strength four score. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Robert Black was a predatory paedophile and a psychopath. Whatever made him that way, his upbringing or his genes, once he'd started acting out his fantasies, it was impossible to stop him. He was unable to turn off his perverted urges. Rehabilitation simply didn't come into it. If you wanted more proof of his psychopathy, look no further than the three words he uttered after his conviction in 1994. After putting the families of his victims through a lengthy and harrowing trial, he turned to the police, including Hector Clark, and said simply, nice work, boys. He was already serving life. What difference would admitting the murders have made? And then there were the other cases laid at his door, crimes he neither admitted 
nor denied. There were dozens of child abductions, rapes and murders across the UK. During the 18 years between 1969 and 1987, Black's suspected victims include April Fab, Christine Markham, Jeanette Tate, Suzanne Lawrence, Patricia Morris and Pamela Hastie. Mary Boyle, a six-year-old from County Donegal in Ireland, vanished in 1977. Her body has never been found. And Black's been linked to the disappearance of young girls in France, Germany and the Netherlands over the same period. Questions about these cases were met with a wall of silence. Black took what he knew to the grave. Robert Black was the essence of a psychopath. As Superintendent Raymond Murray told reporters after Black's conviction for murdering Jennifer Cardy, the child killer was a lost cause to humanity. Today, my thoughts are with Jennifer, the fantastic little girl, as she's been described to me, and no doubt the fabulous woman that she would have grown up to be, and that opportunity was denied her, and it was denied her because she was cruelly murdered and taken from her family. This brings us to the final part of this podcast, and the most difficult question of all. Why? Why did Robert Black kidnap, violate and murder young girls? I've worked with Pip Watts for many years and we share an interest in what drives the criminal mind. Pip, what can you tell us? Can we answer that question? Why? Well, when trying to understand an offender like Robert Black, psychologists split their motivations into two broad categories – nature and nurture. Nature covers aspects like genetics and mental illness, things the offender can't control or can only control with great difficulty. Nurture covers environmental factors, how they were raised, traumas, addiction, etc. As Jack said earlier, we know almost nothing about Robert Black's early life. Was he abused by his foster parents, the Tulips? Were his earliest memories of physical and sexual abuse? Did he think deviant behaviour was normal? And did adults, his teachers for example, ever question his obsession with genitals or his lack of personal hygiene? Today we call these behaviours red flags, but when Robert Black was a boy, there was no child protection services as we know them. He was shunned as dirty-minded and smelly Bobby Tulip by his peers and adults alike. As for trauma, his time at Red House and that year in Borstal affected him deeply. As an adolescent, he was systematically abused, sexually and physically, by adults with power over him. As an adult, he abused children, specifically little girls, who were easy to dominate. Remember how he was bullied at school and in turn bullied younger children? There's a pattern there. Black's environment growing up influenced his behaviour as an adult. Now for nature. We know nothing about Black's parents, specifically whether there was a family history of mental illness. Bear in mind though that Black was assessed by psychiatrists in prison. He was never sent to a secure mental hospital and he never pleaded insanity or used mental health as mitigation. As far as the system and Black himself were concerned, he was sane. Did he have other conditions? Little was known about autism or ADHD when Black was a schoolboy. Children with learning difficulties were labelled retarded or ESN, educationally subnormal. Black's social awkwardness, his lack of empathy and his intensely private, personal fantasy world point in this direction. Lastly, something which is only now being understood is fetal alcohol syndrome. We don't know if Black's mother drank during pregnancy or if so, how much she drank. But we do know that alcohol consumption during pregnancy affects the development of the unborn baby. In Black's case, though, there isn't enough data to say whether that was a factor. So, based on my research, I conclude 
that Black was scarred by his experiences as a child and a young adult, and this compounded an undiagnosed antisocial personality disorder. Taken together, these factors had catastrophic consequences. Thanks, Pip. It's great to have you on Psycho Killer. Nelson Mandela said, There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Robert Black's soul was as black as his name. He was a deviant and a freak. But I wonder, would he have turned out differently if society had been more compassionate when he was a child. You can join in the debate about Robert Black on Twitter at PsychoKillerPO and check out our website, psycho-killer.co. Now it's goodbye from me, Pip and Jack. We'll see you again soon on The Dark Side for another psycho killer shocking true crime story.